So I think we are ready to begin. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Eli Lehrer, and I'm president of the R Street Institute. R Street is a pragmatic, free market, right of center think tank located in Washington, DC with offices around the country. We work on a wide range of public policy issues ranging from congressional procedure to technology. Some of our better known staff include former FBI General Counsel Jim Baker and Godwin's Law creator Mike Godwin. I'm pleased and honored today to have with me Claudia Christian, our speaker and author of the new book, Journeys, right here. Oh, it doesn't look that good in the background, does it? <laughs> uh, I should have remembered these Zoom, how these Zoom backgrounds work. I first came to know of Claudia's work as an actor creating the character of Susan Ivanova on my all-time favorite television show, Babylon 5. I remained aware of her career and enjoyed reading her first memoir, Babylon Confidential. While continuing a successful acting career in voice performances, film, and television, Claudia has also distinguished herself as someone who has played a significant role in influencing policy. Her advocacy for the Sinclair method and other medication-assisted treatments for alcohol use disorder were and are having an impact through her own C3 Foundation, her film One Little Pill, and more. The book, which you should buy um, on Amazon, BN.com, or any other place books are sold, it's actually quite good. Uh, I really enjoyed reading it. It is an interesting, telling, heartwarming, and occasionally even funny stories of overcoming AUD. It helps underline a fundamental truth that's important for all potentially harmful behaviors. Abstinence-only approaches never work across the population. Science and common sense indicate that we must do more, that we need to do more. And Claudia has played a major role in helping outline the way we can. Her new book, describes a lot of the ways that people have used this method, have managed to overcome AUD, and have really made a difference. This is a woman who makes a difference. I'm pleased and honored to have her today as a guest of our street, Claudia Christian. Over to you, Claudia. Oh. <laughs> wow, I got a little teary listening to that introduction. Thank you, Eli. I'm just honored to be here. You've helped so much uh, in spread the awareness and having me in DC speaking to the Senate and introducing me to people that help with policy. It has been groundbreaking and I appreciate all of your support and our street support. So thank you for having me. And I'm really pleased to have two individuals with me today that, um, that cover so much of, of what we have been working on at C3 Foundation, what I personally have been working on. David is an excellent example of somebody who came from 12-step programs and then into uh, a medical-based treatment and has seen both worlds. Katie uh, works with a telemedicine company that has a comprehensive program that deals with the biological, psycholo psychological, and social aspects of alcohol use disorder and herself used the Sinclair method and had a very somewhat brief time on it as opposed to me who spent almost a decade on it. Katie became sober after a little more than a year uh, on TSM. So we really have a wonderful mix of people here and I'm excited to talk about obviously my passion in life which is helping people understand that there are options to treat alcohol use disorder and that not every single person is the same and you cannot be myopic in your, in your understanding of treatment. You have to understand that every single pe person drinks for different reasons. They are biologically different. Their neural pathways are different. We now understand that there are medications that will help people in the GABA system of the brain that perhaps don't respond to naltrexone or nalmaphene. So this is science and you're correct in saying that we must treat this scientifically and medically first. Let's get rid of the biological issues of addiction and then deal with the psychological and social parts of it, or best yet, treat them all together at the same time. So I'm excited to talk about the book as well, but I'm going to wait for you to ask me questions. <laughs> sure. Uh, so Claudia, previously you were very much in your previous memoirs, very much into using naltrexone and TSM, very much in particular. Yeah. And this book and some of your more recent work has embraced a broader spectrum of solutions and ways to go about this. 
Could you talk a little more about that, please? Yes. Um, when I began my journey, um, I approached my GP and asked for this medication. I had done my own research on it after trying everything from 12-step programs to traditional rehab to abstinence, just cold turkey. I tried everything, hypnotherapy. I talk about it in my TEDx talk. I mean, it was ridiculous. I was getting hypnotized and going on no sugar diets and I was trying wheat grass diets for, for I mean, I you know, $40,000 spent at various snake oil salesmen and rehab facilities. So. I had had a breadth of, of uh, information thrown at me and, and a lot of examples of things that didn't work. So I, when I finally found out about this medication that could potentially help me, and I read Dr. Roy Escapa's seminal book on Dr. Sinclair's work, The Cure for Alcoholism, I was gobsmacked. I thought, how could nobody have told me about this? I felt sort of ripped off and, and I felt angry that for losing a decade of my life. But I went to my doctor and my doctor at the time said in no, I mean, absolutely blatantly, he said, there's no way I'm going to prescribe you an addictive medication to replace an addictive issue. And I, I said, excuse me, this is, this is not an addictive medication. He immediately thought that this opiate antagonist was an opiate. This is, this is how uneducated doctors are on certain medications that can be used off-label or on-label for alcohol use disorder. I was very upset with him, and had I had the, the resources and the time and the energy um, at the time, I probably would have sued him for malpractice for not prescribing me this life-saving medication. That was that, I mean, it was literally this medication could, could have saved my life at that moment and ended up saving my life and it is non-addictive, and it is generic and inexpensive, and it was ridiculous that he had denied me just because he was too lazy to look it up in his little black book. So I ended up finding a doctor that did prescribe naltrexone to me, um, a doctor that was much more open-minded. Now, in the meantime, I had been on it for three months. I ordered it from a, a pharmacy online in India. So I had been on it. I knew that it worked. So this is, this, I'm coming to, to them with this information saying, this is working for me. Now you have to understand just the ability to go to your doctor and, 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 and say honestly, I have a drinking problem. And you can throw a stone at any single doctor anywhere in the world and ask that doctor, do you have any patients that present with any symptoms that you would think that they are drinking to excess? Or do you have any patients that have said to you, I think I have a drinking problem? And I can pretty much guarantee that all of them would say, yeah, I have patients, but yet they don't research modern ways of treating this problem. So when I finally got my prescription for naltrexone, I was overjoyed. And needless to say, I, I wanted to shout from the rooftops. I mean, if you had diabetes and you found an easy way to treat your diabetes that wasn't expensive and that actually worked, wouldn't you tell other people? Of course you would. That's just human nature. You want to save other people's lives. So I started talking about it and I started writing about it. And I started and I did my TED talk and I made my film and then I opened up my nonprofit organization. And yes, everything was based around naltrexone because naltrexone worked for me. Using naltrexone in a targeted manner is what worked for me. And at the time, I was a little bit laser focused on the biological aspect of addiction. And that's what I spoke about. That's what I was, the advoc advocacy work was, was about. And, and that's what my passion was about. Over the past decade, I have learned that more medication-assisted treatments work for other individuals. Gabapentin, baclofen, um, microdoses of the anti-nausea medication, odoncitron. Uh, there is tapiramax. Um, there, there are medications, and Katie can speak more at length about these because she's involved daily using combinations of the medications for patients. Um, Medica other medications that work for people. And of course, I, I really wasn't taking into, con into consideration the psychosocial aspect of addiction because I was so obsessed with the biological aspect. If you can get rid of the cravings and the white knuckling and the compulsive obsessive thought about alcohol, you can get rid of that in an individual, then wouldn't they be more apt to listen to a therapist or to listen in a 12-step meeting or to listen to their psychiatrist? Yes. It seemed kind of obvious to me, let's get rid of the biological issue and then work on the rest of the reasons why you're drinking. But if you're just a genetically prone person, 
to be addicted and your life is great and your job is great and you have no childhood trauma and you've never been sexually abused and all these things, maybe all you need is the medication. Who am I to say? I mean, 40% of, of people who are addicted to alcohol do not present with any dual diagnosis of a mental issue. So where does that leave everybody else that doesn't have the mental aspect of addiction? It leaves them needing a medication. So yes, Eli, I did definitely focus on naltrexone in the beginning of, of this, um, my advocacy work, because that is what I knew. That's what I, I knew worked for me. But over the years, I've learned a lot more and I've learned more about different centers of the brain. A lot of people are affected in, by alcohol in the opioid system of the brain, but a, some small section of people are actually affected in the GABA system. So, those, so naltrexone won't work for those people. So there's a sliver, a tiny sliver, of, of the population that we do need other medications for. Now, Trexone works for the majority of people with an alcohol use disorder, but it doesn't work for some people. So we need to have options for everybody. Very good, very good. Now, uh, Katie, I, I might as well bring you into the, uh, into the conversation. You, um, if you could talk a little bit about your, um, about your uh, background. And, uh, and what brought you to this? Absolutely, yeah, thank you, Eli. Um, so I had struggled with alcohol dependence for about a decade throughout the entire duration of my 20s. Um, when I first started drinking, I really didn't care for alcohol at all. Like I would just hardly have any when I was at parties and I would give it away, rarely drank on my own, um, just didn't care for the effects of it and the taste of it. Um, and then fast forward a couple of years and I started drinking more because of the people I was hanging around. And honestly, before I knew it, I had kind of fallen into this dependence on it that, that was a daily thing where um, I noticed, okay, I've been drinking for a week and I tried to go a day or two without and I noticed I started to have these cravings and thoughts of it and I'd be fighting the cravings and, you know, really resisting that urge to drink. And um, I remember when I started drinking more regularly, I, um, I thought that it was just a phase, like, oh, you know, I'll go through this, I'm in my 20s, and, you know, I'll, I'll get out of it, it's just a phase I'm going through. But when I started to notice those cravings um, that weren't going away, that's when I really started to um, come to terms with the fact that I, I had a problem with it. And that last, that started about, I would say, like a three to four year time of really trying different treatment methods like Claudia said you know I tried so many different methods too and I think a lot of people discover the Sinclair method after they've tried so many things whether it's AA or whether they're just trying to moderate and limit it to the weekends or hypnotherapy or meditation retreats or even inner work like I was seeing a therapist and doing a lot of inner work trying to uncover you know the root of this problem but um, nothing seemed to last for me long term the longest amount of time I got um, through of sobriety was six months before the Sinclair method. And I would always go back to drinking. And so like a lot of people, I accidentally stumbled on Claudia's TED talk one day because I was always on Google and YouTube trying to find others who had find, found a method that worked for them because deep inside me, I knew there had to be an answer. I didn't want to have this problem my whole life. You know, I have tons of family members who um, have gone through alcoholism and are still going through alcoholism. Um, but I knew there had to be an answer out there. And so when I learned about this method through Claudia's TED Talk, which has now millions of views, um, I was so excited to give it a try. And um, it took me a couple of months to find a doctor because I didn't know about all of the options that exist now because there's so many more options than just a few years ago and you know, even 10 years ago when Claudia started. Um, but I got started on the medication and ultimately it just, it worked gradually. It took me a year to really um, reduce my, my drinking. You know, I went from a daily kind of binge drinker, at least a bottle of wine a day in most days and on the weekends more. Um, and over the course of a year, it was just like, you know, I'd chip off a day a week where I'd be drinking six days a week and then five days a week and then four. And it kept going down to the point where I was drinking about once a month and um, ultimately just chose to go sober because four months had gone by and I hadn't desired to drink at all and actually kind of am still at this place where I'm repulsed from alcohol just because it would bring me down because I had developed um, 
you know, a life that was so full beyond alcohol because, you know, the naltrexone works so well to get rid of those cravings. I had more spaciousness in my mind and my heart just to kind of explore myself and explore hobbies and other things. And so um, I ultimately went sober from alcohol after about a year on this method. And it's been a little over a year and a half now where I haven't drank and I can honestly say I don't, I don't miss it at all. And, um, you know, this experience has really inspired me to be an advocate for it like Claudia is. I work with, as she mentioned, a, an organization called RIA Health, and they provide a whole comprehensive program to really guide someone through this process. Um, I make YouTube videos. I interview people who've been through the experience just to help spread the word because like so many people who discover this method, it's, it's unbelievable. You can't believe that you've never heard of it before. Often you've tried so many things and failed and you're at your wits end thinking, oh, this is never gonna, this is never gonna subside. It's a lifelong battle, but um, it's really a miracle how the medication works. So I'm happy to be a success story. And um, I think I'll spend my whole life advocating for this just to make it more well known. Thank you so much, Katie. Uh, and I, uh, it's a very interesting story. Uh, David, could you introduce yourself quickly and talk about um, sort of where you're coming from on this, on this ish, set of issues? Sure. Hi, uh, my name is David. I live in Los Angeles. Um, it's, uh, it's an honor to be here in R Street, and uh, I'm so grateful to Claudia and, every, and the work that she does. And uh, I have the life that I have today because of Claudia. Um, I uh, have been on the Sinclair method now for two years and nine months. Um, I, prior to that, I was um, in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I've always uh, been a very anxious person. Uh, I've got a lot of depression and anxiety in my family. Um, also come from a family of binge drinkers. So uh, I think the combination of all of that, um, alcohol sort of came as a great relief uh, for me at a very young age. Um, my high bottom really was just uh, excessive drinking and um, I started to have crippling panic attacks. And I think from there I got really scared and I just, uh, you know, I, I did what I think a lot of us do when we're sort of in the throes of this and we're really scared and we don't know where to go. We go to the first place that we know of, which, which is uh, AA, which I think is a great organization. I have a ton of friends uh, that are uh, part of AA. Um, and I went uh, and I stayed sober for two and a half years. Um, I did what was asked of me and uh, I, you know, I actually did get a lot out of it, but there was something that was happening the longer I stayed sober, which is uh, something that I didn't realize until I learned about much later, which was the al al alcohol deprivation effect, which is the longer I stayed sober, the more I craved alcohol. I know that's not an experience for everybody, but I do know that is a, something that a lot of people do experience and uh, they just don't talk about it. And you know, I went to my sponsor and I said, what's going on? I'm doing the work, I've, I've got 10 commitments, I've got, you know, I've, I've, I'm, I'm in fellowship, I'm fully engaged, but I'm still craving alcohol more so than when I was sober. And you know, the answer that was given to me was, you know, more commitments, um, more prayer. And uh, to me, that was just, um, that was not a satisfying answer. And, but I didn't know where else to go with this because nobody talks about this. And uh, I didn't know there was a scientific reason for this. So I just stayed sober and miserable and uh, more miserable in sobriety than I did when I was sort of in my cups. And uh, it wasn't until that I stumbled on Claudia's TED talk, and then uh, her documentary, One Little Pill, that it sort of revealed to me there was a scientific reason for why a lot of these symptoms were happening to me, and everything just started to make sense. Um, I was really nervous about taking the plunge from going from abstinence into this new frontier. I don't know too many people that have spent a significant amount of time in traditional recovery and then transitioned into the Sinclair method. It was probably the scariest thing I've ever done because I was basically going to be engaging in the behavior that got me to where I got in the first place. So I was so terrified. Um, I wanted to do it in conjunction with 
seeing an addiction specialist. I included my family and I talked to them about the TED Talk. We all watched One Little Pill. It was like a collaborative um, experience for all of us. I'm very lucky that I come from a supportive family. And, um, you know, I took the plunge and I immediately noticed a difference when I took naltrexone. Um, there was this sort of, uh, to describe it, it was almost like that euphoria you feel when you have that first drink and there's this sort of relief that washes over you. I didn't have that euphoria anymore. Um, however, for me, the brain is a tricky thing. And um, after a few times of trying naltrexone and then drinking, the brain started to remember what I used to, how I used to drink. And I'd say within about a month and a half, um, I wasn't drinking nearly as much as I used to, but I was, I was drinking a lot and I got really scared. And I thought, oh my gosh, what have I done? I've sort of detonated a bomb here. And I didn't know if I was going to be able to um, get myself sober again, if I needed to you know, jump ship. So I went back to my addiction specialist. He reminded me this is very common. The brain is a tricky thing. But the longer you continue to drink on naltrexone and the less you get out of it, um, your brain will adjust. And uh, it did. After a year, I started to notice a huge decline in my interest in alcohol. Um, I started to not get anything out of it and my uh, enjoyment factor was really low. I was so relieved because I, I didn't know if it was going to work for me or not. I know people are sometimes uh, immediate responders to it, but I was not one of them. Um, so I'm really grateful that it did work for me in the long run. Um, people ask me now, like when I talk about the Sinclair method, like, you know, what is your drinking like now? I think that's the first thing they want to know. Um, I tell them that um, I always, I more often than not choose not to drink, but I have the choice. And for someone who has anxiety and for someone who overthinks everything, having that choice is, there's such a calm, there's such a uh, ease to it now that I never had doing it the other way. Um, I would say the only other, mis the only mistake that I made, and if I had to do it over again, is I I did not do any type of therapy immediately after I started taking naltrexone. I just thought, oh goody, I'm drinking like a normal person and life is you know, the way I wanted it to be. But I didn't do the interior work, which um, I think is so important to this work that we do here because until you can fully investigate the why, um, I think a lot of those old habits are gonna still remain habits and for me, um, that was sort of the missing piece of the puzzle two years into the process. Um, I work with Lion Rock Recovery, um, and I work with a specialist who happens to be nine years sober herself, and I'm so grateful. Um, and she has not only been so helpful walking me through what I think is sort of sort of mirrors a lot of what traditional step work is, but she walks me through the step work. There's no anxiety about it. The approach to it is uh, very... Uh, very casual, but uh, she does, I, I think my biggest challenge for myself remains to be that because I drink on occasion with naltrexone, I don't sometimes consider myself in recovery. And, you know, Claudia has always been really tough with me on this too, about like, no, this is recovery. Um, it's just that, you know, this is not a traditional way of doing it. And my sober therapist is uh, helping me sort of get that self-esteem because, you know, when we think of recovery, we think of only doing it one way. And that's been the, another big challenge for me. Um, yeah, so two years, nine months in, um, you know, I have, I have the life that I've, you know, always wanted. I mean, yeah, I, I still have issues and I still have challenges, but this is, this is managed in a way that is much more comfortable for me. And um, I, I'm, I'm so grateful that I have found the Sinclair Method um, and, uh, yeah, that's, I think that's my story. I'm sorry if I went over the, the oh. five minutes that was asked of me. <laughs> your story, oh, always, your no story is so great. <laughs> no worries at all. Uh, it was a good story. And thank yes. you so much for sharing with all of us. So our street is first and foremost a public policy institution. Uh, and one of the things that interests me that we were actually talking about before the panel, uh, Claudia, is... Um, what can public policy do? What should government and other institutions do uh, to provide alternatives other than essentially the abstinence-only approach? 
Oh. Well, I, I, I definitely feel strongly that SAMHSA should include uh, medi medication-based uh, uh, treatments, including the Sinclair method, and not make the stipulation that it has to have uh, psychological help to be considered on their registry as an evidence-based treatment. I also strongly think that um, that judges need to be educated so that they don't court mandate violent criminals and sex offenders to AA meetings, as opposed to thinking about um, medication first. You can use naltrexone implants or the Vivitrol shot with a much higher success rate, even though I, I don't uh, advocate um, either of those because it's not targeted extinction, but I know that they have worked for individuals to reduce cravings. So instead of immediately sending anybody who comes into court who's had a DUI or has uh, had some violence associated with alcohol, they immediately make them go to AA meetings, even though the success rate, no matter how you slice it, is less than 5%. Less yeah. than 5% of people are successfully sober for the rest of their lives through going through a 12-step program. Once again, I'm not putting 12-step programs down. They work for some individuals, but they don't work for the majority of individuals. And that's not not a falsehood that's just the way it is the rehab facilities don't work for the ma majority of people either because it's a fake environment you're not exposed to alcohol while you're in there even the second you get out do you really have the tools do you have the, the ability to 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 not get influenced by your friends that's the social aspect of alcoholism so so i think that judges need to understand that there are other ways of helping people through it i also think that there could be an incredible amount of work done in prisons without, with, with prisoners, inmates who um, are addicted or were, were physically dependent on alcohol when they went in, had multiple DUIs, had mul multiple infractions and, uh, and issues because of alcohol. They could actually use naltrexone in a targeted manner and use visual cues instead of actually alcohol. So you can use visual cues that simulate drinking alcohol and you could rehabilitate people in prisons. I know all of this costs money. We can start small, but these are all things that once again, public policy should also dictate that doctors take continuing medical education, CMEs, towards learning more about these medications to use for alcohol misuse. Because for a doctor just to tell every single patient, you know, oh, you're drinking too much, go to an AA meeting, that's irresponsible. That's lazy and it's irresponsible. You should educate yourself as a doctor. You took a vow to save lives. Well, times have changed. You're telling somebody to sit around with a bunch of alcoholics and quote things from a 1930s book. Would you do that with a heart patient? Would you tell your diabetic patient to go read a book from the 1930s and commingle with people that also have diabetes and that's your treatment? Don't get me started. I mean, <laughs> you know, the way we treat addiction is barbaric. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. We need to step into science and step into the future. So there's many ways that public policy could be changed to reflect this. Katie and David, uh, do you have any public policy ideas? What do you think governments, federal, state, and local might do to make it easier for people to understand the range of options that are available? Um, I don't think I have anything to add to what Claudia said. To be honest, I'm not super up to speed on kind of the uh, bureaucratic side of this, so perhaps I should educate myself more. But I think, you know, the people who are interfacing with those who have the alcohol use disorder, you know, the physicians, because I, I personally hear from people all the time, they tell their doctor about their drinking problem, and the doctor says, oh, it's not that bad, or oh, just cut back, or um, like Claudia said, go to AA if they're really concerned. But for the physicians who are the ones that are responsible for the patient's health, I think that is an opportunity to educate them through legislature or um, mandatory education. I'm not sure, but um, for them to know that this is an option, because even if someone is over drinking once a month, it might not seem that bad, um, but to them it's bad. And this is an opportunity while naltrexone or other medications can come in to mediate that so they're drinking at the level that is that is helpful for them because binge drinking once in a while or however frequent it is it's still harmful to someone's health and this is an amazing treatment for you know the spectrum of alcohol use disorder depending on the different severities so that's my my two cents david 
Yeah, I, I agree with everything that Claudia and Katie has said. And, you know, I'm, I'm not a policy person. I can only sort of humanize the experience. But I, I do know that uh, more information and awareness of other treatment options for people is so essential. Um, you know, we are, we are in some dark COVID times and, and Claudia has been advocating this on her, her uh, blogs and her websites that people are home drinking excessively, people are um, really detached. And, you know, this is my personal opinion. I think people um, resist treatment or any type of therapy when it comes to AUD for so long is because of the idea that there's only one way to fix this issue, meaning that you are gonna have to get sober. And I'm not saying that some people don't need to be sober, but I'm just saying to have that as a general blanket statement keeps people too sick for too long. And I just think uh, an awareness that there, are, like what Katie was saying, just that this doesn't have to be something that people start when their lives have been completely decimated, that they can get on this train much sooner in their life and it can help lift them up when they're just at the beginning of something that is um, uh, uh, causing harm to their life in any way. Um, definitely, you know, on college campuses when, you know, excessive drinking is uh, mandatory. I just think having a tool like this is just, uh, you know, life-saving. So, I mean, for me personally, um, the reason why I'm here today and talking about this is that I just wish when I was sort of flailing in my recovery that someone was able to sort of swoop in and catch me and say, look, you're not bad. This is not not working. This there might be a different way for you. Let's try it this way, and it would have just saved me. And you know, I, I that's why I'm here because I wish someone had been there for me. And it, it wasn't until I found Claudia's work that I was able to actually consider that there was another way to deal with this. Um, uh, Eli, if I can comment, David brought up a really excellent point, and that is that you do not have to be already deep, deep, deep into alcohol misuse or alcohol dependency to start some of these medications, all of these medications. So I work with people as young as 18 years old who are binge drinkers. We're talking about college campuses and education on a college campus. If you find yourself more prone, uh, I mean, think about all of the, the things that, that happen when uh, a young person is drinking to excess. They're exposed to more violence, more sexual crimes, um, not to mention their grades and the, the repercussions of the hangovers the next day, but all of these things, they're, they're, keep, they're making themselves extremely vulnerable. So if they have alcoholism in their family, if they have the gen predisposition genetically to, be, to develop an AUD later on in life, let's save them the, that time of their life, this precious time, and let's get them on a medication before they become a full-blown alcohol-dependent individual. That's one thing you, uh, David mentioned, which is excellent. Also, money. Okay, we want to talk about uh, policy. Alcohol use, alcohol misuse costs the United States of America $250 billion a year. So we're talking about just in a very general, not, not the human cost, we're talking about the trickle down effect of lost days of work, of small businesses, of employees, of um, uh, car accidents, uh, um, hospitalizations. All of this equals up to $250 billion a year. So in my opinion, if I was in politics, I would say that there certainly could be more advocacy for harm reduction so that we can reduce the cost of the effects of alcohol misuse in this country. I mean, that's just a no brainer to me. Someone making this available through insurance companies, if I was an insurance company, I would not want to spend $50,000 for ineffective rehab facility. I'd rather give my, my insured individual uh, a prescription for a generic medication that costs less than a dollar a pill and access to some what psychotherapy maybe some cognitive behavioral therapy on the side that's going to cost way less so so not only are these treatments more effective they're less costly so so right there you have savings in it so we're going to talk about money we want to talk about the human cost and we want to talk it be, uh, talk about it being a prophylactic about keeping people from developing alcohol use disorder early in life by targeting this and by really promoting harm reduction because abstinence-based treatment, 
Like you said in the very beginning of this conversation, Eli, do not work for the majority of people. And if you're 25 years old and somebody says the only way you're going to be able to quit drinking is to be sober for the rest of your life, it is daunting and unrealistic to tell a 25-year-old that. So let's come up with some options here. And, and that, at the end of the day, is what we're talking about, options to treat an individual on an individual-based So, way. Yep. Yeah. I would like to, uh, to have a question inspired by uh, one of the people, one of the comments we've got in the audience. Uh, Bonnie Dwyer uh, says, yes, college kids ought to be prescribed naltrexone as often as they are prescribed birth control. The two issues are intertwined. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Bonnie. <laughs> yes. Uh, so yeah, there's obviously a fair amount of truth there, but yeah. one of our street's major public policy pushes has been to move towards pharmacy access uh, for birth control generally, um, particularly uh, the pill, but also uh, a variety of other um, uh, uh, pharmaceutical uh, contraception. Uh, would it be, a, and that's um, for those who don't know, pharmacy access is where a pharmacist can give you a prescription um, as they can in California. We desperately need that for naltrexone. Can you do the same thing for naltrexone? Absolutely. I've been fighting for over-the-counter naltrexone for years. That is, a, that is the public policy that is the most important. Let's get naltrexone either over-the-counter or just pharmacy able to prescribe it, a pharmacist able to do, prescribe it. Absolutely. That would save, first of all, there wouldn't be any shame or stigma of having to go to your doctor and then being refused. Okay, that's a double whammy of, of, of shame and guilt. I, it's happened to me twice with doctors. You know, I, I admit that I have a problem and then I'm refused the medication. So yes, Eli, that is the number one uh, program that would help the most in this country and in every country in the world is just easy access to naltrexone. Without a, per, per, first of all, there's never been a complaint to the FDA since 1994, when when it was uh, when it was FDA approved naltrexone for the use of alcoholism, there hasn't been a complaint and there hasn't been a death. So why are we keeping this safe, non-addictive medication away from people? Seriously, it's that's a fantastic question. So uh, please, uh, members of the audience, we have some questions and I'll be reading them, but please ask your questions and we will take as many of them as we can come to um, as it goes on. So uh, Pam Doyle asks, how do you determine if you need another medication? Obviously, none of us are doctors up here, I don't think. Mm -hmm. So obviously, part of the answer is talk to your doctor, but any other well, any it, anecdotally, yeah, anecdotally, um, I have met people over the years uh, that I've been coaching informally or formally um, who simply didn't respond to naltrexone. So they were taking it religiously. Compliance was not an issue. They were motivated. They were taking the medication, waiting the full hour. They were mindful. They were increasing hobbies, doing alcohol-free days. They were doing everything you're supposed to do in a comprehensive program. They were even having therapy in conjunction with it they were doing everything right and their drinking simply wasn't decreasing. And that means that they're one of the tiny percentage of individuals who do not respond to naltrexone. We know that. We know that it's a small percentage, maybe 8% of people just do not respond to naltrexone. So if that's the case, yes, you would go back to your addiction specialist or your doctor and simply say, look, I've tried naltrexone for six months. Here's my drink log. Nothing's happening. I want to, I want to consider another medication. And then your doctor would, would help you decide which medication is right for you. If it's for cravings, that's a different kind of medication. If it's for sleeplessness, if it's for, if you just don't want to drink, you want to be sober, then that's a completely different medication from somebody who wants to still socially drink. So that is, you need a medical, uh, a medical advice for that. So uh, we have a few people asking uh, questions, uh, uh, Marcus Tempe, um, a few others um, asking, what else can be done to help um, advance th this type of work? What else can be done to <laughs> What else can, Marcus, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, uh, I can just say um, that, that donations have plummeted because of COVID-19, and that's understandable. People have lost their jobs. And I happen to run a nonprofit organization, a 501c3, that relies on donations. So C3 Foundation is, is you know, squeaking by. I have, I have one employee who runs the whole show and we are the only North American um, uh, nonprofit organization who does advocacy for the Sinclair Method. So how can you help? 
go find some uh, high rollers to donate <laughs> to organizations like C3 Foundation to support us in doing this work because we literally, um, we, we, we've spent now seven years in July, we turned seven in July. And when I started this, there was one doctor in the United States that would prescribe naltrexone as per TSM protocol. And now the entire country, other than the state of Arkansas, is covered. So, I mean, that's pretty remarkable that we have managed with our little grassroots movements and with people like David and Katie and all of these people that are on TSM giving back and paying it forward. We've managed to get the entire country covered with TSM friendly doctors. That's remarkable. Imagine what we could do if we had a million dollars a year in our budget and we weren't literally striving to make our rent every month. I mean, imagine what we could do with even a half a million dollar budget every year. So Marcus, to answer your question, donate. <laughs> That's how you can help. Or better, if you don't have the money to donate, here's what you do. Tell your doctor about it. Say, listen, I've got a lot of friends or I have one friend who used naltrexone in a targeted manner and now they don't drink as much or now they're sober. Educate doctors, educate friends and families. When you go to a party and you see somebody drinking too much or Uncle Fred drinks too much or Aunt Louise, tell them, say, hey, I watched this film, One Little Pill. You should watch it. Or, hey, there's a TED Talk. It's not even 15 minutes long. <laughs> watch it. So there are resources out there. Just spread the news. Share. When I first started TSM, I couldn't shut up about it. I still can't, actually. So all I did was tell people about it. And that's how you can pay it forward without actually spending money. So uh, I, um, I'm going to take the moderator's privilege to partly answer one of the questions myself. Um, okay. <laughs> this is part of a... Uh, it's part of the work that our street does generally. Um, Patrick um, Celetrene, um asks, is there a similar cure for someone who is smoke addicted, meaning cigarette smoking or tobacco consumers? Uh, the short answer is that harm reduction is possible for almost any harmful behavior. There may be a, there may be a few where it doesn't. I don't really know of a way to do crack in a reduced harm way. But, for most um, harmful behaviors, there is a way. There's a whole um, body, and our street, among others, has done quite a look on it, on tobacco harm reduction. Uh, now, clearly, uh, people use alcohol, use nicotine, because they derive some benefit from it, and because they find it pleasurable. Uh, there are ways to do these things um, without doing as much harm. The harm from smoking, for example, is largely because of smoke. Uh, there are so many carcinogens in cigarette smoke that we can't actually really figure out why it causes cancer because you're taking so many carcinogens at once. You take out the smoke and it's still addictive, still not good for you, but a lot less harmful. And this is possible for a huge range of behaviors. And in fact, one thing that I hope to do and that our street hopes to do is to bring together all of these different ways of reducing harm um, of various behaviors, um, pre-exposure prophylaxis for um, riskier sexual behaviors, uh, needle exchange and needle access for opioid use, and TSM and the like for AUD, and a range of things, including medication-assisted treatment and uh, non-combustible tobacco products. Um, ranging from snooze to vaping um, can have an enormous impact the same way. Uh, so that's, um, so the answer is yes, harm reduction is possible for almost any dangerous behavior um, that people engage in. A lot of people ask me that, is this like Shantex? And the difference is, is uh, no, it, it, cigarettes are affect a different part of the brain that, that alcohol does. But the interesting thing about um, naltrexone is it can be used for gambling, uh, for on, some online porn and sex addictions, for cutting, you know, harm, harming oneself. It can be used for that. And now they're experimenting with anorexia and bulimia as well, using these opiate antagonists that fall into the family, naloxone, Nalmethine and naltrexone. So there, there are a myriad of harm reduction um, activities that, that, that this can be applied to. The medication-assisted treatment, uh, because of the way it works, the medication-assisted treatment for smoking is 
that has a very high failure rate. It's not zero. It's not zero like AA. It works for some people like AA for AUD. It works for some people some of the time, and that's mm -hmm. good. Um, so uh, uh, I'll take another question from Sonia Murtla. Um, I'm in the UK. How is the relationship with NHS progressing? Uh, actually, C3 Europe, um, headed by Joanna and uh, Moira and my, my good friends there, uh, has done remarkable work with the NHS. And the NHS was offering TSM years ago, um, but they called it the anti-binge drinking pill. The only problem is they, they made people do so much excessive uh, psychological support work along with it and then quite often they would cut the person off from the medication once their drinking declined and as we know now and we i knew then uh, tsm is a lifetime commitment if you continue to drink so you cannot give somebody medication for four months and then suddenly they get their drinking under control and then you no longer give them access to the medication and that's what happened at the nhs so now that they've been re-educated about this method um and they are including naltrexone nalmefine works uh, and, it, and actually it's it's a preferred medication in a lot of countries in Europe and the UK, but it has a very high rate of side effects as opposed to naltrexone. So now that the UK is also using, and Europe is using naltrexone and nalmaphene, so individuals can, can choose which one they want to use, um, they're having much better success rates. And as I said, C3 Europe is working with them directly and pretty soon, and unfortunately COVID-19 affected the, this, this um, policy that was going to be launched, but it's it's still going to be launched and there's going to be more access to targeted use of naltrexone for alcohol use disorder in the UK. And right now, yes, you can go to your doctor and ask for it in the UK. And yes, you can go to C3 Europe, just go to C3 Europe and you, you can ask them all the questions and they will help you directly get your medication from the NHS if that's your choice instead of a private doctor. So everything you need is in C3 Europe to answer your question. NHS has done probably the best job of promoting harm reduction broadly of any uh, of any national health um, entity uh, in the in the world. Uh, they have generally embraced it, uh, and you know there obviously are problems, uh, but in general, I think NHS's general commitment to harm reduction is quite admirable. Yeah, they have a huge, huge, they're changing alcohol policy, they're changing the taxes, they're changing, they're starting to really, um, really crack down on it because it's such a devastating issue in the UK and in other countries as well. I lived in the UK for on and off for 10 years and, and, you know, the binge drinking society is not just, it's not a joke. It's, it's, it's really adversely affecting the youth um, and, and multi-generations of people. And it's just, a, it, it, it needs, it, people need more information and definitely more access to different options of treatment. So uh, we have another question from somebody who identifies him or herself as Buzzkill. Um, <laughs> so uh, does naltrexone address the thinking, the thinking and preoccupation with alcohol availability? Yes, that's the biggest thing that I noticed when I started TSM um, back in 2009. I, the, the first, first time I took it, uh, I realized that I, I, I had poured a glass of wine and I, and I was more interested in the food that I was eating. And that glass of wine sat there through the meal, which before in any situation, if I, especially a social situation, I would be completely focused on is there enough wine for everybody at the table? I should have brought more wine. And I wouldn't be listening to the conversation. I'd be watching the wine. Oh, he's taking a big glass. Oh, I, I should drink this faster. Oh, I mean, it was just awful. I was, I was ob uh, mentally obsessed with, with wine. And that was the problem when I attended AA meetings as well, is it didn't get rid of my mental obsession about alcohol. But now I was obsessed with the fact that I couldn't drink alcohol. So, it, so I spent my life, a big portion of my life, being obsessed with either thinking about the fact that when am I going to drink next? Or thinking about the fact that I could not drink and what social situation can I be in where I can avoid alcohol? I was always thinking about alcohol. 
So to, to answer your question, Buzzkill, yes, that's the beautiful thing about naltrexone. It addresses the compulsive nature of addiction, which is that compulsive thought process and also the biological issue of cravings and white knuckling. So all of that is eliminated with naltrexone. And then you can work on the interior work, as Katie and David have both said, is so important. I can't hear you, Eli. Oh, yes, yes. Um, oh, okay. I forgot to hit the space bar. Uh, so Katie and David, any, any other thoughts about on that? Uh, so uh, Patricia Gear um, has a question. Uh, she is uh, thinking of scheduling a session with the coach um, to work on this stuff. Could you please describe what the first session is like? Do you ask for any client background history? And is there any other preparation um, that coaches like uh, clients to have prior to a session? If, if you're talking about the coaches, you will find on yoursinclairmethod.com, which include myself and Katie, um, and two other ladies that are well-versed in the Sinclair Method. Um, I can speak for myself. What I usually like is somebody to send me their drink log or at least a brief history or something, but we can cover that also during the meeting. Um, it really depends on the individual. I like to find out how long they've been on it and what their issues are and any questions they have about it. Obviously, that's, that's just basic information, but I want to give them tools to take it a step further. There are people who become stagnant in their medication assisted treatment. They suddenly they reach a plateau and they want to go further. They want more alcohol free days. They want more, um, you know, they want more sober activities. They want more, um, they want to start a, a different phase of their life. And so I try and help them with that as well. And then there's people in the very beginning who have to deal with compliance issues. So, so each individual is different. You know, you have to determine what their problems are. And um, it, it depends on the person if they want to send that information prior to the meeting or if they just want to discuss it organically and see where you go from there. But every person is different, especially if they're just beginning the Sinclair method or just beginning or if they're a year in or they're three years in. I have people who have been on it for seven, eight years who suddenly uh, go away on holiday and forget their pills. And now they, they, they didn't comply and they relearned the, the problem drinking. So they have to start over again. So, so you know, I have, I have pay people with, with creative issues and nobody's the same. Uh, Katie, do you have any other? Do you have any other thoughts? Any other perspectives on that? Yeah, kind of echoing what Claudia said about it really being individualized because I work with people who are just getting started and kind of want you know a foundation of best practices of what to do or not to do in the first 30, 60, 90 days, um, and then also people who've been on it longer and need help with kind of implementing mindfulness tools or you know things to do to kind of trick themselves in order to getting more progress on the method or find other ways or other things that they can do with their time. So it is really individualized. And I too, like Claudia, I gather information ahead of time just so I have a basic understanding of where they're at. And then we explore, you know, what their needs are in that time. And usually they leave with tools or things that they can implement, um, you know, starting right away for the next 30, 60, 90 days or so. All right. Uh... Uh, this is a medical question, so, uh, and obviously we should preface this by saying that anybody who answers this is not a doctor, so <laughs> not a medical degrees, but I, uh, uh, um, one person asks, um, as far as I know, regarding the need for a prescription for naltrexone, does it require an initial liver blood test to sure that it's safe, as naltrexone is metabolized by the liver, is that correct? Uh a lot of doctors will ask for a liver test. Um, to, I know doctors that simply look at the patient in person when they were doing uh, in, in office visits back before COVID-19. Um, they would look at their eyes for any yellowing. They would just examine the, the, the patient and feel their liver. And if they felt that the person looked healthy, they would give them the prescription to naltrexone, knowing that 50 milligrams of naltrexone is not toxic. You can take upwards of 300 milligrams, according to doctors, uh, before it becomes damaging, to the, even remotely damaging, and that's on a daily basis. The clinical trials use, most of them used 50 to 100 milligrams in the clinical trials of, of naltrexone. Um, so doctors really take it on a patient-to-patient -patient basis. There are some telemedicine doctors that do insist on um, a liver 
scan uh, or uh, um, uh, uh, testing of the enzymes so that they can see if they're elevated or not. But like I said, a lot of doctors don't, um, especially if somebody has been on it before and they've ordered it online and now they just want to continue on it. You also have to remember, according to many doctors that I speak to, that over-the-counter pain medications are far more destructive to a human liver than naltrexone is. And naltrexone has been used for other issues, such as MS and fibromyalgia and cancer and sleep issues. Uh, so, so it's, it's it, anti-inflammatory Crohn's disease. Naltrexone is used in low dose for so many things. And once again, let's go back to the fact that we have not had complaints filed with the FDA about the toxicity or the destruction of, of the human health from naltrexone. So to answer your question, it depends on the doctor and they might ask for, for a liver test. <laughs> and, none and, I'm not a, and I'm not a doctor and not, none of us have medical degrees. <laughs> this is all anecdotal. <laughs> yes. So, uh, uh, this, uh, um, so we're running low on time, but we will take one last question for an anonymous attendee that I think is a pretty good way to wrap up. Uh, what if you have another disorder? Uh, I have an eating disorder, bulimia. Does that affect your progress on TSM um, for treating AUD? Interesting. Um, I have uh, uh, a lot of people I've known over the years that have a, a dual diagnosis, um, anorexia, bulimia, plus alcohol use disorder. You have to understand that people self-medicate also with mental issues with alcohol. So you can have schizophrenia and alcohol use disorder. Um, with bulimia, we have found, I have found personally, that people with eating disorders, um, women especially, tend to self-medicate with alcohol. Um, I had anorexia as a young lady, so I, I am well-versed in eating disorders. Um, I have found that the patients that I work with uh, that are on naltrexone from doctors um, and supervised by doctors and then come to me for additional support actually do really well on naltrexone. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, they are working on using naloxone for bulimia and anorexia. And there's actually a drug out right now um, that has a, a sort of mixed reviews called Contrave that uses naltrexone and Wellbutrin to treat overeating, binge eating, all of this is in the same area of the brain. So this reward system of the brain is affected by opiate antagonists. So to answer your question, I don't think that you would take any back steps in your bulimia behavior by being on TSM and it might actually help. But I, once again, I'm not a doctor. I don't know your specific case or what your experience is, is or your activities in your bulimia. But I will say that just from my own experience, I found that women with eating disorders and men with eating disorders have done very well using naltrexone for their drinking. So uh, thank you so much to all the panelists and all the attendees. I'm sorry we couldn't get to every question. Uh, the questions you have asked were excellent. And I cannot thank Claudia, David, and Katie enough for your time. Uh, our Street Institute remains committed to promoting harm reduction and TSM and Claudia's work. Uh, please consider buying the book. It's excellent, <laughs> uh, even though it looks weird against my background. And uh, yes. <laughs> and uh, and uh, please, uh, please continue to promote harm reduction. Absolutely, it does not work for the population. E Eli, I want to thank you and R Street. You've always been so supportive. And Katie and David, thank you also. You've all been, you've been so supportive as well. Sharing your stories helps save lives. So I want you all to know that. And thank you, everybody who attended and asked these great questions. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.